Good afternoon. At the tone, Pacific Daylight Time will be 5, 4, and 30 seconds. Water. Oh my god, we're having an earthquake. Wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Can you feel that? Okay, this is interesting. There go the lights. Oh. Here at the Scotts Valley Library. It is the 19th of September 2019 and we are speaking with Joe Hall about the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having us and thank you for doing it for the community. Would you start by telling us how long you've been in Santa Cruz? Uh, we moved here in 1973 so that's what 46 years now. So and during that time I worked with the city of Santa Cruz uh, first as a, a junior associate planner and then in various positions in planning and then in redevelopment after the earthquake. Okay. Would you like to tell us your earthquake story? <laughs> I'm sure everybody who watches this will have seen a lot of stories. Um, there was one we mentioned in the preliminary of the interview that I thought was interesting and probably won't be talked about too much, but before the earthquake uh, the state passed a law I don't remember the number, but the law required a certain period of time that buildings that were deemed unsafe for earthquakes, uh, they are basically unreinforced masonry buildings, URM was kind of the initial for it, they had to be upgraded. Uh, and our chief building official took it to heart and went down to the Chamber of Commerce and had a meeting and talked to all the downtown businesses and a lot of the buildings there, like the Bookshop Santa Cruz, you name it, were made out of bricks and those bricks uh, uh, weren't all that stable because they were just stacked on top of each other, they were on soft soil, when the building shakes, they fall over. So the state's goal was over some period of time was to uh, uh, reinforce the buildings. Well, the landowners, they didn't have the money to do it. So it was kind of a, a paradox where everybody wanted to do something, nobody had any money, and you had these two forces kind of coming and colliding in terms of what could be done and in essence it was going to be nothing because there was no money to do it. The building owners, didn't, they weren't rich wealthy landowners or they didn't want to spend it. So talking to our financial advisor Mark Northcross, I thought of this idea, there's something called a Melarus district and I won't get into the grass of what it is, but you form it over an area uh, like downtown and you can issue bonds against it. Well there are two values in downtown really. One is the buildings, and they had no value because no bank would loan on a building that was unreinforced. But the land had tremendous value. Well, the Melorus district could allow you to take the value out of the land, and you could loan it back to the owners, and they could get loans to fix their buildings up. It was, I thought a pretty brilliant idea, if I could say so. <laughs> and it was pretty obscure, but Senator Henry Mello took it upon himself to uh, uh, sponsor the bill. And it was kind of a... Uh, something I'd never done before. Uh, most people, unless they're a lobbyist or have some specific interest, don't do bills. Well, it was a great education for me. Went to a bunch of hearings, explained it to people. Our financial advisor helped me. It was really just a two-person operation with Henry Mello. The bill got through the assembly and the Senate. I think there was one no vote. I don't know who it was. And it got to the governor. And I thought, wow, look, we've done something. The first step. Well, what happened was a little bit of a surprise ending, as you might say. Uh, the governor vetoed the bill. And I remember when Ray Miller, who worked with me from Henry Miller's office, called me. I said, well, why? He said, well, Henry's really mad. And uh, it's funny, uh, Henry's office called him Henry. It wasn't Senator Miller, it was Henry. And he's going to reintroduce it, so could you get the mayor to write a letter uh, to reintroduce the bill? And uh, so I wrote a letter and sent it down to the mayor, Marty Wormhout, and uh, before she signed it, the earthquake happened. And so it was kind of like, it was, just, it was just serendipity. So I'll tell you in a minute when I got the letter back off her desk with all the dust on it and everything. But it passed afterwards, SB27X was what it was. And it's been used in a couple of places. But that was kind of my introduction. And then to have the earthquake happen after the governor had vetoed the bill, Governor Dick Majin was, uh, it was kind of like, you just, you can hear the bells rattling in your head. Now to the day of the earthquake, um, probably everybody's talked about it. either they're watching the baseball game or they were going home to watch the baseball game. Uh, what was happening to our family is I, at work I was a principal planner at that time and it was 1989 
And I said, told everybody, go home and watch the baseball game. I ordered a pizza at Pizza My Heart, and uh, I went up to pick our kids up at Holy Cross Church. And my wife was in San Jose going to some training for her job. Uh, and I think what was the job for it was home savings. It's a bank doesn't even exist anymore, but she was training for something. And so that was my day for, you know, child. So I go up to Holy Cross to pick them up. Uh, they have a little daycare trailer. And I was in there and the earthquake hit. And the trailer just shook like crazy. I held an empty bookshelf up like Superman, but that wasn't too hard. Our kids dove under the table because they'd all been trained. And after it was over, I went out and looked and the church tower hadn't fallen off. And I thought, oh, it wasn't that bad because I lived as a kid. My dad was in the army. We lived in Japan. And I, I remember earthquakes as a kid where you could see the land rolling. So I thought, well, it wasn't as bad. And you remember before we had a number of precursor shocks. So and I knew our house was in pretty good shape because we just retrofitted it. We'd only built it partially because that's all we could afford when he, we started it. And my wife took a class from Cynthia Matthews on peace of mind in earthquake country. And so I call it the $5,000 class, but um, it, it, I knew we'd done everything we could do. And I had the kids, so I really didn't care. But I knew also, because we'd had a near flood in 82, that my job then was to go back to the city and work. And what do you do with two kids in a car and go to work? Well, we went down and um, uh, it was kind of interesting when you think about it emotions some <laughs> start to come through but uh, I got to the parking lot and I said is everybody out and, but we don't know we left and I said well somebody has to look so I told the kids stay in the car it's a Volkswagen it's solid it's in the middle of the parking lot there's no nothing here asked the people to look ran upstairs and uh, there were still two people under desks and one of them had a, a darker complexion her face was blanche white I couldn't, I, I really, it was just shocked to me. I thought they were playing. I started laughing. It kind of broke the emotion. So I said, you can get out now. The building's fine. And uh, so with that, I went down, told the kids, stay in the car. Don't do anything. And, you know, there, uh, Eric was, I think, in the fifth grade, and Christine was in the second grade or third grade. So they were kind of young. But what do you do? I mean, how do you split your life between what you know you need to do and what your family obligation is. So I just said, stay here. So I ran down to Dick Wilson's office and was there. And I knew nobody was in City Hall. I mean, it was practically empty. The whole town had stopped because the baseball game was going on. And uh, there was uh, Dick, Emma Solden, uh, Judith, and I, I think that was Dick and myself. And uh, the phone rang. <laughs> I still remember picking the phone up. And Dick said, well, could you quickly go down and see what the damage is downtown? And so that's damage assessment. You hear all these big things about damage assessment. Well, when there's nobody there, and I think somewhere at the end, just before I left, Steve Belcher came in. And what really helped us is there was a, a shift change in the police department. So there were a fair number of police officers around, and the police were in the city hall complex at that time. They hadn't moved to the building they're in now. And so I went downtown looked through uh, what I saw, and you could see the dust. The dust was still in the air. You could see people running. You could see, you could see some of the injured people. But I knew my job was just to let him know so he could start out what to do. And I'm kind of making this a little faster because some of the stories I hear in these things, people talk and they, they don't bring it to the point too quickly. So anyway, I went through. There was a young police officer. I checked with him to make sure that uh, he, he was, and he said, I just checked the Palomar, it's okay, everybody's out, because that was a, a senior citizen basically living. Ducked my head into the Cooper house and everybody was out there. And I knew the Cooper house probably would be okay because the owner, Jay Paul, had done a fair amount of retrofitting and he tied the floors in, but you could actually see, and I'll talk about in another chapter, the Cooper house. So I went through and did a real quick assessment and I actually didn't think it was as bad as it could have been because there wasn't as much collapse. And we had done a study of the buildings as part of this work to do SB 27X to see <clears throat> what buildings would fail and what buildings wouldn't fail. And owners volunteered because some of them were concerned. And actually, if you take the study out, it's now at the archives at the university, 
and, and you look at the buildings, the ones that were supposed to fail, failed. It was just right on schedule. It was pretty amazing. And this all happened in just flashes of time of, of just, I can, it's kind of going through my head really fast now thinking about it. Anyhow, so I went through, uh, went back to Dick Wilson and said, it's not as bad as we thought, but it's, you know, it's, it's downtown's closed basically. And I don't remember all of what I said. And he said, well, we're gonna have, we're gonna have people evacuating. Could you get to Civic? Cause that was our uh, evacuation point ready to, to go and I knew where the emergency supplies were because I kind of keep things and I had a storage closet of old planning files up in the uh, ceiling, uh, the, I don't know, attic of the Civic, there's an area and I knew that's where all our what's called then civil defense stuff was and uh, that's where all the beds came that you see in those pictures in the uh, book and I went into the Civic and the head janitor I think was in shock. He was just with the dust thing going around the floor, getting all the sand off. And I tried to talk to him and he just, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't registering. So there was another young um, woman there and I just happened to meet her uh, over the time and she was a janitor and she's now a dentist. And so there's some always fun little stories of people. And I said, okay, can you, can you set this up? Because I, I thought she was pretty bright. And I told her, showed her where everything is. I said, we need to get all this down here, down here and set it up. And I said, and can you round up enough people to, um, to see if we can do it? She said, I don't know. So she literally went out in the street and grabbed people. They set it all up. And she said, well, how do I have the, she was, I remember talking, I said something, and I love making up titles. That was part of being in the service. You remember titles for people. And I said, uh, uh, what do you, um, yeah, just call yourself chief of the auditorium. Nobody will know the difference. And all through this time, my kids were in the car. What do I do with them? Where do they go? I know I'm gonna be here a long time. They can't just sit in the car. I can't bring them with me. Cause it, I mean, it, it's, it's, it was just hard. And I didn't know where my wife was. Turned out she was on 17 when it hit and she was just past Big Moody Curve. So her, life was probably saved by, you know, who knows, seconds, a minute, I don't know. But she turned out to be okay. She got home and she really didn't know what to do. There were no cell phones in and whether they worked. So somewhere in all this confusion, it struck me that I should uh, figure out something permanent for the kids, but I couldn't get them home. And so I, I realized Cynthia Matthews lived around the corner. So I took the kids over to Cynthia's house, knocked on the door, and I said, can you take them? And they knew her. So they spent most of the night with her until Bill Matthews drove them home. And because we were getting reports of bridges down, beach flats collapsed. I mean, the, the kind of the reverberation of stuff is just immense after an earthquake. And I knew, I'd hear these stories, and I knew the bridges were there because I didn't think they'd go anywhere. And when I was running around downtown, I saw the pedestrian bridge was there. So anyhow, they, they got taken care of. So that was a huge relief off me because I could just focus on work. And uh, then the people started to come in uh, pretty quickly that you know knew they had to go to work. We didn't have a lot of the training they do now, but a lot of us as a team had been in the city in 82 when the river almost flooded. So there was kind of a, an understanding more than a manual of what to do. So people started coming in, the uh, parks department took over the civic auditorium. Uh, somewhere down in the middle of the night, the Red Cross showed up and they started registering people. And I remember Don Lane came down and I asked him if he could help lead the people because a lot of people had m been moved out of the uh, uh, St. George and the Palomar and moved to the uh, Calvary Episcopal Church parking lot because it was kind of warm. Where do they go? What do they do? And um, so Don actually would lead groups of people into the Civic. And a lot of people were worried about going into the Civic because we'd had an earthquake. But I kind of remember my grandfather worked in WPA projects and the Civic Auditorium was a WPA project. And it may not be you know, it was, may not have been correct, but my memory of him telling me is every WPA project was built 
twice as strong as it should be because when the people were off the job, they had no job. So everything was done with more patience and that. So I figured if it withstood that, it would withstand everything. Because where else do you put people out in the middle of an open field? And uh, so anyhow, he moved them and then Marty uh, Wormhout, the mayor, and John Laird, who was on the city council came. And I asked them if they could just talk and visit with people because everybody was coming in in kind of a, a state of shock and, you know, and there was the tremors were coming in. I don't know if you lived here during it, if you were younger and because the land shakes all the time. I, the one in Ridgecrest, I, the people were, you know, not complaining, but just saying, it's, we keep having these aftershocks. Well, they happen and some of them are pretty big. And then that whole wave of memory hits you. And I've heard, you probably heard this a million times from the other. Anyhow, so they came. And somewhere around three o'clock, I just ran out of energy. And uh, I knew the kids were home because uh, somehow the Matthews got word to me they were home. I got home <laughs> and my, mat, my wife was kind of mad at me because she, she was worried to death. She didn't know, but there was no way we'd tell her. And so uh, uh, I, I don't know if I slept much that night because I got up real early the next day and went in and back to work, but uh, what was, it was kind of interesting going home. <laughs> what saved our internal part of the house, other than the earthquake work, is when we had little kids, we had all these things on the cabinets so they couldn't open them. Well, we had never taken them out. So our house was literally untouched other than one little small crack in the, she in the uh, tape on the sheetrock, and that was it. So it was made my life a lot easier. The next day I went in and Things that the, the momentum of what you do after the earthquake had really picked up. And the staff I supervised uh, was split into all sorts of different groups. The people were familiar with building went on inspection crews. Uh, another person went down because they fenced off downtown and he started supervising that. Charlie Eady, Norm Daly was an inspector. Everybody went different ways and there I was. What do I do? Because in that sense, I didn't have anything to do. And, um, I thought, and, and it, it gets kind of interesting how all that shakes out afterwards and the energy and that. And I said, well, the one thing I learned from doing the uh, SB27X is we're going to need a lot of money. And I just said, well, you know, everybody's running doing stuff. This is going to be a much longer term problem. And uh, I was older then. I'd been in planning a long time and I knew people and I just started calling. And that began all the funding that we got over the years. And I always call that phase of my life dialing for dollars. And I think some of the miracles of the earthquake were first, not that many people were killed. And I think that's thanks to the baseball game because people went home to watch it. We didn't have all the things where people could sit at their desk and watch. So they went, they went out of the buildings downtown. Um, that was kind of the first miracle. The second miracle was it was on TV. So the whole country saw it. They saw the things shake. And that brought a lot of attention to it. So we were able to uh, um, get a lot of support for the city afterwards. And uh, the third thing was is the damage outside of downtown wasn't as bad as I expected. I had no idea because I really didn't look for a long time. So that was kind of, um, that was the day for me. I went home, got up, and then your life changes after that for a lot of other people too. Their businesses were destroyed, the town slowed down. Uh, we all took different paths, and uh, that was the path I took. And I was on the phone, and this was before uh, computers in all the offices. So it was, it was a, a different time to round up help. But what was nice is people volunteered to help. Our, uh, I called our redevelopment attorney because I had started a little redevelopment project, and he told me about some bills they'd passed after the Kalinga earthquake, and we started working on those. and. When I would show up to Sacramento, I was always tired, and you'd look tired. And so we got a lot of assistance, and that was nice. So that was kind of where I think I should stop this, because it could go on and on and on and on, that. Uh, the one thing I do recall that was kind of interesting is they do it more now, but they brought in some psychologists. So I thought, I don't know if I need to talk to a psychologist. Everybody has challenges in their life. But what I started doing as I said, if you think to the future, you'll, you'll be a lot better in the present. So I started taking pictures. And the result of it is this little book I did. And it's just me. 
and I took pictures of downtown, of what it was like. This is the best one right here. You can just see how totally devastated things were. And not to go through every picture, but there is what you have now on the uh, Lower Pacific. That's what it was looked like. But I just started taking pictures of the before and after. And it kind of, uh, you know, gave me a feeling of uh, uh, looking forward as opposed to always just saying, uh-uh. And uh, it was funny. One of the subsets of this was our levees failed. And um, I was uh, doing flood control at the time also because we were trying to get our levees raised after the 82 flood. And that happened 18 years later, but that's <laughs> it takes time with the federal government. But uh, what was kind of interesting is the Corps of Engineers flew in. And it, now our little disaster, when you compare it to what we've seen in New Orleans and Houston, wiping out whole islands, uh, our timing was good in terms of attention. I don't know what it would be like now, but uh, here's a picture of the Corps General coming in. This, this, by the way, is the Sentinel book they did. Some people have probably brought it, and so I have mine. And there I am, right there. There's the Corps General. And that was just, a, and that's Bruce Van Allen. He was the mayor, and he'd been on some of the river committees. So people were brought in to do different things. And since I was in the Army Reserves, uh, Marty said, well, you and Bruce go, you're, you know, you're in the, you know what the Army's like. <laughs> I remember that. And I thought, these guys are in another world. That, to show you how little life goes on, and then we'll talk about the next chapter, it was my daughter's, the father of my daughter's roommate in Berkeley for four years. So there we met. But those are kind of the fun things you think about after the earthquake, not all the sad things, but uh, it looked pretty good still. But uh, anyhow, <clears throat> the one other little story or, or tale's the wrong word is um, the Cooper House. And that one I haven't really talked about much because there was so much emotion around the demolition of that that I just decided to keep my mouth shut and not say anything. And um, there's some things I learned about the Cooper House that I really didn't know at the time. I kind of vaguely remember in the San Francisco earthquake, the bell tower fell off. <clears throat> so, uh, but uh, I got a call somewhere, I don't know, a week or so later after the earthquake from uh, the mayor. I don't know, it wasn't, it was from Dick Wilson. He called me up and I had worked uh, before all this, one of my early jobs was I uh, helped prepare the historic preservation ordinance with a, a group of people here in town, a committee. And so I was always interested in older buildings and that's one of the jewels of Santa Cruz is they have a little bit of history still visible. Uh, you go to Southern California and it's not there as much. But anyhow, um, he said the mayor, uh, Marty Wormout, wanted to get a second opinion on, on the Cooper House's uh, stability. And the FEMA engineers that came in were kind of your, well, structural engineers come in all different flavors. Some are creative, some are orthodox, some are conservative, some are liberal. It's just like human nature. And they looked at this brick building and say, you got to tear it down. And the reason that was important is at that time, FEMA had a rule. If you didn't tear down everything that was destroyed within a certain period of time, they wouldn't cover the cost which would have meant the city would have had to pay to tear it down if the owner didn't want to. And at the same time, I, was, I had gotten calls from Jay Paul, well, what do I do? Well, first of all, I told him, you're a hero. If you hadn't put the money into doing what you did to the building, that one floor, second floor would have collapsed down and you probably would have dead people in the building. Instead, you were able to let people got out. The walls separated, you could see through from the first floor to the second but the rebar was holding it up that he had had put in. He didn't want to put the rest of the uh, reinforcement in because he thought it would make the building look ugly. Michael Bates actually did the work for him. And uh, so anyhow, uh, I was, he says, well, Marty wants to get some other engineers to take a look at it. Well, just by chance, I'd been appointed to the State Historic Building Safety Board, Historical Building Safety Board in 1979. So I'd been on it for 10 years and so I, knew a fair number of the uh, structural engineers in the state that dealt with older buildings. And immediately I thought of one person, Loring Wiley. He's still active uh, engineer. He works in Degenbolt, and I think that's still the name of the company in uh, San Francisco. And I thought Loring is the one person I would trust 
to be fair, knowledgeable, and able to, to just help in this. Because the engineers, they had one from LA said you could save anything, and you have another one saying tear it down, and here's the mayor and everybody in the emotions. And uh, so I drove up with uh, Charlie Eady to uh, uh, San Francisco, and we took this little pinto the city had. And uh, <laughs> I remember we put the flasher on it, and we put the Red Cross, the little Red Cross flag in the back, and we went up Highway 1, and there was nobody on the road. It was, I guess, close enough after the earthquake. We made it up to San Francisco in an hour in to pick his office up. They were ready. We brought him down in this car, and Loring is a tall, big person. I remember sitting there. It was like he was on a modern airplane now, unfortunately. And he came down, and we took a tour of the building. And they took pictures. We had an aftershock in it. I was downstairs, and I saw a brick fly across right in front of me. I said, mm, I don't think we should stay in here. So we all left the building. But they had taken a lot of pictures. And I asked him, well, what do you think the building, is it savable? Can we do something? Well, the first thing he told me, which I really wasn't aware of, he said, well, this comes from a period when courthouses were built of all masonry. There's no wood in here. And the reason it was built completely of masonry so they wouldn't burn, because over time in history, courthouses would burn, all the community records would be destroyed, and people would lose all that part of their legal life. So they started building these buildings all out of masonry. And he said the foundations probably don't hold too well in the soft soil. And uh, so I said, well, how would you rate it? You know, simple answer, because I knew I had to probably provide a simple answer. And uh, uh, <laughs> I said, in a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being bad and 1 being good, he said, oh, it's probably about a 7. And I said, well, what would you do to, to save the building? He said, you'd probably have to tear off the first two floors, rebuild the foundations, or do something. I mean, it was a, he gave a pretty good assessment. And, you know, I've been on the same board with another 20 years with him, and I watched him go through his mind. So I know now even more that what he told me was that. And I've had people tell me, oh, no, they could do this, they could do that. Maybe they could have, I don't know. But the idea that it was built for a purpose that it served, but it didn't serve the purpose of an earthquake was interesting to me. But also the fact that you probably would have had to substantially change or reconstruct the whole building. Who's going to pay for it? I mean, where's all this money going to come from? Maybe the community would have given a chance. I don't know. Or maybe it would just sat there for the next 20 years while everybody argued about it. But uh, the idea that it had been built for a totally different purpose and went through an earthquake and was pretty heavily damaged. Uh, and, and he gave some more descriptions, and I don't remember them all, but he started to describe how you could do it, and it was a huge operation. Whereas the building across the street had the county bank, had a, had a nice facade, but the inside was wood. So you take out the wood, and you hold the wall up, and you save the building. Well, this building, there was no wood in it. It was all masonry, as heavy as can be, and the foundations didn't support it. And it's still a challenge to engineers to support heavy masonry buildings and soft soil in earthquake country. So anyhow, I went back to City Hall and uh, reported. And I, you know, so I remember a couple of people saying, oh, I bet you he said you could save it. Uh, I, I said, no, I'm afraid I, I didn't hear save or not. I, I just heard that the building was uh, had some serious problems. And it, it, it isn't an easy solution. And it's privately owned, too, but I didn't even get into that. But I just remember the, the energy that hit me when I came in. It was like, well, here's the historic guy wanting to save a building. And the reality is you can't. Well, thanks to Loring, I've always felt that we did what we could do for the Cooper House. And uh, uh, so it proceeded, and it did exactly what it would, should have done. It was hard to tear down because it was a big base masonry block. It was not a... Uh, thing. It just sank. And to s make it safe for the next earthquake would have been a huge endeavor. So that was kind of the, after the earthquake and the first night, uh, that was probably the most, memorable is the wrong word, but uh, excruciating experience I had because it was, I felt really bad about it. I mean, I was hoping Loring would have a way to save the building, but I knew he'd tell the, what he thought was true. And, um, 
that was the story of the Cooper House. Did, it, did the earthquake impact your life after, after those instances? Yeah, I, uh, my job switched. I became, I went, they formed a big, a bigger redevelopment agency and I became the assistant director and somebody was hired, Seal Sorella, who led the rebuilding effort and they produced the, what's called the downtown recovery plan. And there is the first printing of it right there. And if you look at it very closely in your camera, that's looking down Cooper Street and you can see the Cinema 9 and the Cooper House is designed, the new Cooper House, pretty much like that uh, design came out. I think it's kind of interesting. I was not involved in, in, in that process. Uh, I was basically in, uh, doing the financing and going to the legislature and uh, Dick Wilson and I, I think, went a couple of times. I remember once, I think he told me that he had a suitcase packed with clothes because he had to go so many different places and that. So I basically just started uh, writing grants, talking to people, and we were very successful. We had loans re, uh, forgiven. The state legislature about 18 months later finally passed some legislation to uh, um, help us finance our rebuilding downtown. The voters, um, Marty Wormhout and some of the political leaders got a measure on the ballot and that gave us some, some sales tax revenue right away and that's how we rebuilt the downtown. I wasn't really involved in that. In fact, now you couldn't actually get that through because even after the earthquake, that didn't pass with a two-thirds vote. At that time, you only needed 50%. Because a lot of people after disaster, if they live above the floodplain, it's too bad they're flooded. If the house wasn't burned down in a fire, too bad. You know, People dismiss other problems until it comes to them, but we passed that. And so there were just a lot of pieces flying around and it's pretty much amazing to see how it all came together. And it's kind of the history of Santa Cruz, if you look at it, until there's a disaster, it's, a, it's like a, a group of warring factions. It's, the factions' names changes, their ideas change, but there's always this, this friction and debate. And when the disaster happens, it seems to be over history, like the flood of 55 and some of the events before, people start to work together better and they do something and then they, things return to normal. And I remember sitting at a meeting and uh, people started arguing. I said, oh God, we're back to normal. And so that was kind of a nice feeling. But in terms of my life, yes, our kids grew up. Um, both went to Berkeley. We, I worked and worked and we worked for many, many years doing it. And it gives you an appreciation of what it's gonna be for all these communities to go through a disaster like this at, at the time. And, at the time, nobody really wants to say the truth is it'll take decades for them. And look, we're just finishing up the last lot downtown, and that's 30 years from now. Do you think the earthquake impacted the Santa Cruz community? Oh, yes. And you probably have heard everybody's story, so I won't. I'll just say yes. It impacted my life. It impacted my wife's life. Our kids remember it vividly, sitting in the trailer watching it shake. And when you see kids go to the county fairs where they have the earthquake things, they don't want to go do that. <laughs> do you take any precautions against natural disasters after your experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have earthquake insurance, even though I don't think it's probably all that good. Um, huh. We have our go bags. Uh, we just put them together, so we're not perfect. I don't want anybody to think that, oh yeah, these people are goody two-shoes. <laughs> We actually, I don't know what one finally got us over the edge, but we have that. And uh, you think about it and, and you see a disaster that other people have and I think you have more empathy, but uh, you know, it, it's like anything, you move on from it. But uh, I think we tried to keep uh, some awareness of it and we repair our termite damage and whatever we can do that way. <laughs> we, What's it like to reflect on your experience 30 years later? Uh, emotional. I mean, that's, I mean, you can see what almost happened. It, it was so exhausting that first day. And, and to have the, if it would just been focused on doing what I did, that would have been hard enough. But then to have your family and you leave your kids alone, I mean, do you drag them in with all these meetings with you? I don't know. I, I still wonder if I did the right thing or wrong thing. 
But there were people in the parking lot. The Volkswagens are well built. There was nothing around them. So I figured they were safer there. And I mean, I, I still, and whenever I go to these meetings preparing for the earthquake, I said, be sure to figure out what to do with families that have kids around. Because you can't, you know, I went through it. Uh, since most people were at home, they didn't really have that, that particular challenge, but uh, I did, and uh, thanks to Cynthia Matthews, I knew the kids were in good hands, but uh, that's probably the, the biggest thing that tugs on me still. Have you talked to your kids as adults about what their perspectives are on that? Not that or much. You know, I, I just know, uh, you know, it's funny, it's a good question, but no. Uh, I should probably, but... Uh, um, it's just like a flash in front of you and and you know it's always going to be there but you don't uh, really go back on it. Um, I just know one time we were at the county fair and they had one of these juggle things and the kids said, oh, I don't, I don't want to do that. And that was about as much as we've ever done. I know my wife thinks about it more but she's from New Jersey and I should never say this but her two fears when she moved to California were termites and earthquakes. <laughs> And we have both of them, <laughs> but she's survived here. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add that we haven't covered? Well, one funny uh, ending story. Uh, I brought a brick along, and this is part of what downtown was. And there was a lot of angst after the earthquake about, well, the city should have done more to, uh, you know, prevent the disaster, all the buildings and um, there was just, it's just like everything. I mean, as, as long, you have emotions running every which way. You should have done this, you should have done that. Afterthought is, is so clear as opposed to doing it. And I know I did what I did. And every once in a while, somebody would drag me out and I'd tell the story of uh, SB27X and before. But the Chamber of Commerce, after the uh, earthquake, um, put on a really big dinner at the Coconut Grove for a lot of the safety people, the fire police, everybody who was kind of involved in it was invited and it was, it was a, 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 an event free. And uh, at it, uh, John Leiser, who was chair or the executive director, gave everybody a brick who'd been involved and it says it's not your fault. And I thought that was kind of a nice way to end it all. So, and that's kind of the end of my story. Well, that's Great. Thank you so much for coming here and sharing your story with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you.